Storyworthy Media, the best in story driven content. Hello, Mom and Dad, and the rest of you. It's Phil Rosenthal, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannes Finney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm here with Hannes Finney and we're coming to you live from the campus of Hofstra University. Because our guest tonight is one of their most famous alumni. Oh, okay. No, I didn't know that. Where is Hofstra University? Long Island, New, New York. York. I could have guessed that. Yes. All right, fantastic. Figures prominently in a, one of my favorite episodes of a, a certain show we will be discussing later. Is it in Everybody Loves Raymond? My God, it is. What are oh. the odds? <laughs> All right, you guys. Phil because Rosenthal. That's Phil right. Rosenthal is here. Our this guest is amazing. tonight, Phil Rosenthal, he comes forth with the topic, Write What You Know. That's yes. his story topic, Write What You Know. And I'm guessing that's what he did on Everybody Loves Raymond. He is the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, and just one of those shows, it's it's like, you know, it's silly to say, oh, it's one of the best shows ever. It is one of the best sitcoms ever. I think like, between that and Seinfeld, it covers like what it's like to be a person in the 20th, late 20th century when you're single is Seinfeld and when you're married is Everybody Loves Raymond. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's who people are. That are living nowadays. Yeah. And I think it's like that, a time capsule of the era. Yeah. And it's just so, you know, a show is good. There are, there are shows that are on the air that are funny, but they don't stay in your head. Mm -hmm. And there are shows that res resonate. And this is everybody one of those loves shows. Raymond was one of those. Yeah. Okay. But when Phil brings forth the topic, write what you know, I think what he's talking about is the book that he wrote. He it came out a couple of years ago. You're lucky you're funny. That's the name of the book. You're lucky you're funny. <laughs> I, I, God, I wish that was an end of the episode because that's my whole life right there. You're lucky you're I got funny. nothing else going on for me. I, just, yeah. I don't care about people. I'm balding. <laughs> I'm a little pudgy, but I'm funny. So I get away with shit. Yeah. That's well, all you're lucky you're funny. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's funny you should say that because when, when I was, I've been listening to Phil on a couple of different shows and the title Everybody Loves Raymond came simply like that. You know, somebody just said, you know, well, everybody loves Raymond, you know, like. Just like that. You're lucky you're funny. Those do make the best titles, right. don't you they? You just turn around and go, oh, that sounds like, I think uh, like even like song lyrics, anything in art, if it's brand new, but it in your brain, you feel like you heard it before, mm -hmm. that's the right thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, here's what's so great about Phil's book, You're Lucky You're Funny, is I actually listened to the audio book of it. Um, and he narrates it, which oh, right off great. the bat is really good because it reads, it sounds very natural. It's just like you're sitting down with him and he's having a conversation. It's very, it's very well done. I'm looking forward to oh, asking that's awesome. him. Awesome. He's got that. a new show on PBS, which I've been watching. Right. We're going to talk about okay. that. Uh, I'll have what Phil's having. But what I was going to say is so his topic. Write what you know. You know, I wrote a memoir, <laughs> Fit to LAX, My Storyworthy Life. Available on Amazon.com. Go through our website and click on the Amazon banner. That's the or point. buy directly the point from is, Christine. Is I hear what he's saying, write what you know. I mean, it's a memoir. These are my stories, and that's what I could write about. Right. And what I but what I want to say is like I can't imagine being somebody like Stephen King. You know, a fiction writer. Like, what is that? Write what you know. What yeah, so who are that, these no. people? Like the talent that Stephen King must have. In other words, I can get my head around people writing memoirs. I can get my head around that because they're writing their life. Yeah. How do these fiction yeah, writers? Yeah, but to Stephen King, I don't think it's <laughs> it's that far. That stuff's all in his head. Like you just can't. You're not sick enough to imagine what every day. There's no way that Stephen King doesn't wake up and think of a horrible way to murder people. Get the fuck out! It's of it's like he's you really no, he's so? not going to murder people because he's not a psychotic, but he's got a brain. That comes up with crazy shit. Really? So for him, it's real. Stephen so King writing that, that stuff down is not that far afield. You're telling me he wakes up and starts thinking about how to solve a mystery. Well, I'm saying he can. He has a brain that can think of, he can put himself in the mindset of, if I were a psychotic killer, how would I murder people? Like huh. some people just can't do that. Yeah. And they don't write mysteries. I see. They write memoirs that they self-publish. But, you know, it's like, it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks, Han. It's so, good. Dig so that mean, in. Why not? No, do it. Everybody's published today. Um, it's like it's it's yeah. It's like you can put your you know like there are people who couldn't write you know sitcoms because they can't put themselves in the mindset of a character that's not exactly like them. Mm -hmm. But like you can think about okay, this is somebody's mother and they're sixty years old, sixty five years old. What are they thinking? You can put yourself in that in that brain and make it absolutely real, or you can't. Mm -hmm. But that's where the talent lies. Well, Phil Rosenthal, I've listened to a lot of shows that he's been on, and here's a couple of quotes I really like by him. Not all stand-ups can write, and not all writers can do stand-up. That's that's exactly what you just said. Yes. Exactly. So My that's, that's God. I'm gonna sue. This is amazing. Yes, <laughs> and that's here's exactly something right. that he yeah. says, and I I totally agree with this. People that make you pee your pants laughing are good. <laughs> that is true. And and food that makes you crap your pants is bad. Okay, I'll right. go with that. I'll go with that. But anyway, so this book, um, this book, you're lucky you're funny. It goes from his growing up in Queens and and then him moving to Los Angeles. You know, he wanted to be an actor. He came out here as, to be an actor. I kind of assume that because he like acts and things. I saw him in Thirty Rock. He was right. very funny in an episode of. He was uh, in the Simpsons movie. Thirty Rock. He was in the Simpsons movie. He was in all sorts of things. Yeah, so anyway, so it, it, it shows us from growing up in Queens and then how he got here and then how one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And next thing you know, he's a showrunner on this show and it's his idea. and So it's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, it's amazing because very few people come to Hollywood and do exactly what they thought they were going to do. Yeah. If you had asked us if we'd be podcasting, we would have said, it's 1985, what's podcasting, right. and leave me alone, person from the future. Right. Well, anyway, this is it's a fabulous book. It really breaks down what it's like to be a writer on a sitcom. It talks about the long hours in the writer's room. It talks about yeah. a lot of pointless hours. It talks about a lot of food. It talks about a lot of eating and, and what it takes you know, to, to be on a network sitcom. Yeah, those shows famously have uh, the longest hours. I have a friend who was on, I believe he was on the show Growing Pains. He's a little older than us. And he was like, one night, it's like midnight, third night in a row, and they're saying, listen, we're bringing in lobster. And he thought, do I want to eat fucking lobster at midnight? Is, yeah. this, is this supposed to make up for the fact that I'm never home? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't care. I don't care what you bring in anymore. Well, and so, it's just so hard because then, it, you know, these weeks begin on Monday with, with a certain schedule, and then everything keeps getting pushed. So by the time Saturday comes around, you didn't get home until 5 a.m. Yeah, and the, which, shooting and, the, and the shooting and rewriting while they're – I think yeah. a lot of people don't understand this. It's like what you'll shoot a scene in a sitcom, and then they'll confer often and add new jokes, and then the actors have to go and redo the scene immediately. Right. And that's incredibly hard to do on for everybody. So anyway, it's exciting. I want to talk to him about that a little bit. But I also want to talk to him about his brand new show on PBS. Did you know PBS has a little bit of money these days? Seems. Well, yeah, I believe They're they flying. got that from uh, uh, Ray Kroc's widow. Is that right? Yes. When Ray Kroc's widow died, Ray Kroc, who, invented, who created McDonald's, okay. she gave like her entire fortune as an annuity for like 50 years or some crazy thing to PBS no and kidding. NPR. Yeah. Is that recent? 10 years ago, maybe, something like that. So I think that they're, yeah, I mean, the production, people, I love I love PBS. I remember when PBS was the only thing on television that was worth watching. Mm -hmm. Now you got a lot of cable channels that are good, but it's like, man, PBS is awesome. Yeah, well, now they're flying Phil Rosenthal around the world. Around the world. And they're having him talk about food and about culture, and he's fantastic at it. That's the bottom line. He's absolutely fantastic. So we no, are going to- it's just like, yeah, I've seen it. It's like, it's like you or your neighbor went- Yeah to Vienna or... Yeah, in other words, it's not like Anthony Bourdain and we're not talking about high-end, luxury, exotic foods that, you know, nobody <laughs> in the whole fucking world's going to eat. He talks about, like, real food, bringing people together and also the idea is that you don't have to go out of your hometown, most hometowns anyway, that you can actually go within your hometown and find a different culture, a different food that you've never tried and, and kind of get the taste that way. I know. I mean, that's one of the great things about Did LA. Did I tell you I went to Little Ethiopia a couple of weeks ago? On Fairfax? On Fairfax. And I wasn't a big fan. I'll be honest with you. There was a big piece of flatbread mm -hmm. and a lot of lumps of food around it on it. But it was so dark, I couldn't even see. <laughs> I feel like I'm like 80 years old. I'm getting on my iPhone. I How can't are you see. doing? I can't. Yeah. They had very good beer, and I always enjoy that. You know, yeah. the, the local the local. But you're beer. not a foodie. I'm not a foodie. You're not a foodie. I remember when uh, I got you and your, your ex-husband, 
a uh, gift certificate, I think, to tracks down at uh, Union Station. Fancy restaurant at Union Station in L.A. And uh, you had a look in your face like, oh, that's nice. Because you're like, you're going to go and get fries and drink eight beers. Was- that's all that's going to happen. <laughs> well, your husband would have gotten the- like a steak with sort of a crust on it and a thing. And we're getting fingerling you say potatoes. That like it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a poor choice on my part to give you a gift certificate to a restaurant. Well, that's- anyway, I appreciated it. We had a nice evening out and yes. we got divorced. But that's not the point. Yeah, that was. <laughs> the point is I Phil Rosenthal was here. He was like, we have a gift certificate. You can eat anything. I'm not hungry. You drink so much beer. Oh, my God. I want a divorce. All right, you guys, we're going to bring Phil Rosenthal on in just one moment. But before we do, I did want to mention that if you'd like to support the Storyworthy podcast, here's what you can do. Honest, this is the simplest thing, honestly. Yes. Listen. Yes. Just tell your friend. That's what I always say. That's all you got to do. Tell your friends. Tell your friends in person. Tell your friends. I Just go to our Facebook page and share the link to it and say, hey, here's a show I like. There you go. And you find and- us on Instagram and on Twitter at Storyworthy. And why not buy my book? Pick to LAX, my story worthy life. That's a fantastic idea. You know, they can if they buy it from you directly, you get more money than if they That's buy right. it through Amazon. You go to storyworthypodcast.com, I get ten dollars. You go to Amazon, I get four. You see? You have a calculator? You wanna do the math? Uh I'm, no, I I'm don't. fifty years uh, old, Hannes. It's time for the money to start coming in. It's time in. for the money to start coming into you. Yeah, exactly. And even if you don't like the show, as I always say, Tell your friends you don't like it, and they'll check it out. We yeah. don't care where the downloads come from. That's true. You don't have to like us. It's just numbers. It's just numbers. We don't care if we piss you off. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around, because Phil Rosenthal is on his way. Here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have documentary filmmaker John Whelan. And I'll be talking about my documentary, Stink. That's next time on Storyworthy. Hi, this is David Wilde, and I've always wanted to be story worthy. And we're back. We left Hofstra, per se, and uh, we're in the middle of Queens right now. We're actually in the middle of Queens Boulevard. We set up a tent, and traffic's whizzing by us, but our microphones are so good, you can't hear it. That's because Ben Stewart's on sound. Ben Stewart, who who, uh, has a passing resemblance to Aaron Rodgers, and therefore I love him just a little bit. All right, you guys, Phil Rosenthal is here right now. He's a sitcom creator and an author, and he's also the host of the new PBS food series, like I said, I'll Have What Phil's Having. And his book, like I said, You're Lucky, You're Funny, How Life Becomes a Sitcom, is just fantastic. It totally holds up. By the way, did I tell you the audio book? Seven hours. Wow. That's a lot of talking. That's a lot of talking. Well, if you, you need a good trip. Like, we just went to Sedona, so mm-hmm. that, would be, that would cover that whole trip. Well, or you listen for an hour here, an hour there. Do you know what I mean? You keep coming back to Phil. It's like he's with you all the time. <laughs> you keep coming back to Phil. It's like a rash. <laughs> you can find Phil over on Twitter, at Phil Rosenthal. And, of course, check out that new show, I'll Have What Phil's Having. It's on PBS, and you can see it right now. All right, folks, wherever you are, put your hands together for the one and only Phil Rosenthal. Wow. <laughs> well, people ask me how the show came about and everything, and, and I met Raymond, and, and he told me about his family just the way you know you would tell me about your family if we we're meeting you for the first time or just getting to know somebody right he was a comedian he he wanted to uh uh get on the david letterman show and he got on david letterman and 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 after five minutes letterman said there should be a show for this guy so they set about looking for a writer to create a show for raymond i had seen the letterman appearance that he was on and i said of course i would take that meeting they saw scripts that i had written and they said Let's put these two together, see if they hit it off. So we met at a deli, Art's Deli, <laughs> on Ventura, yes. And uh, tell me about your life. He started telling me about his life and his family. And for every crazy story he had about his Italian family, I had one about my Jewish family. And so I said, I think I can work with, you know, the situation of your real family. But when I sat down to write the pilot, I really didn't know how to illustrate. I got to a part, how do I illustrate in the pilot where you have to set up everything? For instance, just how crazy Ray's parents are going to be. And I was struggling with this for a while, and then it hit me. There was a story I told several months back because I was the best man at my brother's wedding, okay? And the best man has to make the toast. So 
you now you have you have a little performance anxiety with that, especially if you come from show business. People are expecting a decent story. Okay. Now, something had just happened in my family, and I thought, oh, this might be a good story. I'm going to tell this story at the wedding reception, and it's not just going to be a story. It's going to be a warning to my new sister-in-law that it's not too late to run, okay? And here's what happened. This is absolutely true. I thought I was being nice. I thought I was a good son. I thought my parents would like this gift that I sent them for Hanukkah just a couple months before the wedding, the gift of Fruit of the Month Club, okay? You know what this is? You know what this is? Okay. So I send it, and I get this phone call. I'm in L.A. I get this phone call from New York. It's my mother. Hello, Philip. Um, your, 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 your present arrived today. Did you, did you know it was a box of pears? And I said, well, well yeah, I, I did, Mom. Uh, do you like them? Uh, she goes, oh, oh, they're very nice, but, but there's so many of them. There, there's oh, over a dozen pears. Well, what am I supposed to do with all these pears? I said, I think you're supposed to eat them, Ma. Myself? <laughs> well, maybe you and Dad. Well, how many pears can your father eat? Philip, please, do me a favor. Please don't send us any more food again, okay? And I said, well, well Ma, another box is coming next month. And she said, what, more pears? And I said, no, no, a different box. Every month, she went, every month? Oh, my God, Max, he got us in some kind of cult. <laughs> my father gets involved. He says, what do you think, we're invalids? We can't go out and get our own fruit? Why would you do this to us? And I start to explain, and my mother says, I can't talk anymore. There's too much fruit in the house. Okay? So I tell that story at the wedding, and I got some laughs. And so when it came time to write something that would illustrate in a pilot episode where you're establishing character, what, how crazy are Ray's parents? We, I had an objective in that show. We had to go over to the house and explain to them that they weren't uh, going to be home for Deborah's birthday, which was a lie. Deborah just wanted in the pilot episode to have her birthday without the parents for once. So he comes over, but before he can lie to them about this, she stops him and says, you know, your gift to us finally got here. Did you know it was a box of pears? And so this was the scene that people told me made the pilot different, made the pilot stand out from other things. Why? Because it was very specific. And what I didn't realize, I just thought it was a funny story. I thought you'd laugh because look how crazy those parents are. What I happily found out is that your parents are crazy too. <laughs> that all our parents are, are you, this is a truth. I didn't know. You can't give your parents a gift without it blowing up in your face. The following year, the show is on. It's doing well. If you're in charge of a show, one of the things that's nice to do is get everybody who works on the show a cast and crew gift. Okay? I got them since we were a, a domestic sitcom set set in a house, I got everybody a toaster that said, everybody loves Raymond on the side. Nice. I send one to my parents because I think they're proud of the show and they supposedly like uh, me. <laughs> so I sent it to them and I don't hear anything. I don't, maybe they didn't get it. So I call and this time my father answers the phone. I say, hello, dad. Yes. I said, did you get the... Did you get the present I sent you? It was, again, for holiday, for Hanukkah, just the, the very next year, okay? Uh, yes, yes, uh, very nice, he says. I said, oh, did you see what it was? Um, uh, what, uh, it was a toaster, right? I said, I'm getting suspicious. I was like, yeah. I said, oh, did you open the box? It comes, you know, it's a Cuisinart toaster. you got to open the box. To see. So go get it. Open it up. He'll see what it says. I'll get the nice reaction. <laughs> There's a pause, and he says, uh, I don't have it with me right now. I say, what did you do? Uh, your mother wanted a coffee maker. They took it to Macy's, <laughs> lied to them. 
right? Yeah. Traded my gift for a coffee maker. And our joke in the writer's room was somebody probably went to Macy's, bought that toaster, got it home, opened it up, saw what it said, put it back in the box, went back to Macy's and said, I'd like the Frasier toaster. (laughs) Right? This just is another example of how the gift, why do I keep getting them gifts? It doesn't work. But my point is that the best stuff... Now... My, when I'm screaming at them, because I called him from work, I'm screaming at him, you are the show. Do you realize you are the show? My father said, you're welcome. <laughs> right? He knew what I didn't know, which was all the best stuff comes from real life. You don't have to make it up. I tell writers, it's easier to write stuff down than to write. <laughs> so if you just go through life, all of us have a crazy story about something that really happened to us. Now, the way I ran Raymond was the way Carl Reiner ran Dick Van Dyke. I learned from observing what he did. What did he do? He asked the writers, what happened at your house this weekend? So your job, if you work for me, your job was to go home, get in a fight with your wife, come back in and tell me about it, right? That's what, that's what we needed. That's where all the stories, 90% of what you saw on that show happened to me or to Ray or to one of the other writers. So, for instance, a, a, one of our writers comes in and she says, my mother made me a sculpture in her sculpture class. And I can't have it out because it looks like a part of the anatomy. I said, what do you mean? She says, a, a lower part. I said, wow, you know what? There might be a show in that, (laughs) right? And then it hits me. Where I grew up in Rockland County, New York, there's a courthouse, and outside the courthouse is a sculpture, a big one, because, you know, this writer, her mother made her a sculpture of this. It was only about, you know, a foot high. But there's a what if we, if on television, you make it a big sculpture, so you really get the joke. So outside the courthouse was a sculpture that was infamously known for looking like this part of the anatomy. And to show my prop department, I'm going to have my parents send me a photo of the thing. I call my house. They're eating dinner. <laughs> my mother answers the phone. You can hear the clinking of the plate, the, the knife and fork on the plate while they, they, I've interrupted dinner. Ma, how you doing? Very nice. Oh, it's Philip. Oh, huh? hello, Philip. You're here from the back, my father. I say, Ma, uh, I'm doing a show, and I'd like a picture of the sculpture in front of the courthouse. Oh, no problem. Max, you need to go down to the courthouse tomorrow with your camera and take a picture of the vagina sculpture. <laughs> and my father, you can hear in the back, he says, the what? My mother says, the vagina sculpture, Max. There's a vagina sculpture at the courthouse? She says, yes, Max, it's called the vagina sculpture. Everyone calls it the vagina sculpture. You've never seen the vagina sculpture, Max? You can't see that that is very obviously a vagina? It's a vagina, Max. (laughs) And my father, there's a pause, and he goes, what do I know from vaginas? (laughs) Where did the show wrote itself? I didn't have to go very far. These kind of things were happening to me on a weekly basis, either in my parents' uh, house or in my own house with my kids. I mean, I could keep going. I know this is the story-worthy show, but I have a million stories of things that were then turned into episodes. In fact, the writers and I did a tour where we would each tell a terrible thing that happened to us at home. And then show the Raymond episode. It became show the clip of, uh, of from that thing. And we went around the country doing that for a while. And we had a ball. So that's my, oh, okay, here I am. Oh, that's, that's, that's nice. so smart. I remember all these episodes you so do. clearly. Oh, absolutely. I have it's more. It's just so bright to take other people's, you know, their lives. In other yeah. words, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can get a lot accomplished. Of course. So if if you can just take a, different people's ideas and everybody's going to share. But they all got share. credit. If like you came in in the morning okay. and said, 
this sculpture thing happened to me, that's going to be your script. So that would be my story of course, that week. and your credit will stay on that story. But I'm not the only writer on the story. No, There's, we all can no, but help, we all help each other. But whoever's story it was, they got the credit for writing that episode. Right. Yeah, yeah, that vagina story. I mean, it's like it, it's such a funny episode because it's in the middle of their living room, and we never say the word, and you never say the word, you never no. say what it looks like. No, and you it, know what it looks like. It, well, the brilliance, I think, was it an exact copy of the sculpture you're talking about because it didn't. You had to squint your eyes to go, maybe eh, not too hard, but not too hard, <laughs> but not, but it wasn't like some kind of thing where it's like we can't put this on television. Well, it's sort of an abstract wasn't, shape. You know, if the the way the characters are reacting is something dirty. Yeah, and then once you're, it's in your head something dirty, you now right now see it's it. all, all all gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, what I remember is a nice little addition at the end where she's going to donate to the church. Yes, and, and they, my favorite uh, line comes from that. Yeah, scene. the three three nuns come in to take it, right. and they're just staring at it. And right. It's like a Jack Benny thing because nobody yes. says a word, and the laugh is just building because yes. the three nuns right. staring at a three foot vagina. Sculpture. That's right, and, <laughs> and then, then she says what when they leave. Uh, they one of them whispers to Marie what it looks like because Marie is like everyone is acting so strangely. What does it look like to you? And the one nun whispers to her, and you see her get it, <laughs> and then she looks at the statue, and then she says to herself, "My God, I'm a lesbian." Oh, that's fantastic, oh, Doris can Roberts. I, can I just yeah. ask you? Yeah, Doris Roberts. I, yeah. I'm gonna. I mean, the whole cast was great, great. obviously, but what am I? Peter Boyle. I yeah, always greatest. loved Peter Boyle yeah. even before he was on that show. What was it? Tell me, please, that he's yeah. as, was as nice a guy as I've heard he is. That he was an amazing. The opposite, really, of uh, what he played. Yeah. Mm. Right? Yeah. So he plays this curmudgeon, kind of, you would imagine, right wing uh, guy. Yeah. He was completely liberal. He studied to be a monk <sighs> earlier in life. And yeah. you know who Best Man was at his wedding? Oh, God. I want to say Mel Brooks. No. John Lennon. Wow. Wow. Oh okay, that, that one that beat Mel Brooks by a mile. How about that? That's crazy. Crazy. And he, you know, he was very, very liberal and and really cool. Wow. Yeah, I love him. Just such a I yeah, him. and it's just an amazing actor. He passed so many away things. just recently, yeah. He passed away the year after we went off the and air. And how old was he? Uh, he was not even seven I wanna say seventy two, maybe. Yeah, young. He was not that old. He had a yeah. uh, a form of blood cancer that was not uh, oh, well i'm glad yeah. he had all those years with you that must have been the time of his life it was the time of our life to get to be with him i bet yeah. oh that's very yeah. nice Just so now listen i watched your documentary the full thing on netflix yesterday <laughs> the whole thing i watched the you whole didn't thing stop in the middle <laughs> exporting raymond okay so this <laughs> yeah. is when phil goes around he takes ex he takes raymond over to, to russia now yes. it's in italy right Poland? It's in, it's, it, we're in 140 countries, just our version with Come subtitles on. or yeah. dubbed. Right. But there are three or four versions now that They're doing other original versions based on... Based on and, our script. So yeah. They Russia's take our scripts, one. they translate them, and they cast their own people. So Egypt tried it, uh, Israel tried it, but <laughs> Russia was the first. And they and asked me to come it's the number one show, over. isn't it? It's the number one sitcom right now in Russia. But it didn't start that way. It was a rough start. So, they number two asked is me Putin to come knows over best. and turn Everybody Loves Raymond into Everybody Loves Kostya. <laughs> and this and is, I took a documentary crew with me. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, yeah. so then you took a documentary crew with you. And they said, that's fine, even though didn't they know you're kind of making a sport of this? Or I wasn't making sport at all. Okay. I, in fact, the, I'm, I'm the butt of the joke. Okay. They, I, the, I, to me, the movie is about a guy who thinks he knows something, yeah. and he goes to a land where nobody cares. Yeah, because you're, yeah. you're the fish out of water. Absolutely. And then you say at that, one By the way, point, that led directly to me, to PBS, because PBS saying saw, they would like yeah. me to go other places. Yeah, they yeah. saw that Netflix, yeah. Netflix special, and they say, that Phil Rosenthal is damn likable. Really and cute. He's super really cute. Really hot. He's and hot. He's, and he's adorable. Likes, no, yeah. but it's he wears a V-neck sweater. It's fantastic. In Exporting Raymond, you really do show your appreciation of different cultures. True. Seriously, this is what I think they they were looking at, and then yeah. just your likability factor. Thank you. At one point during Exporting Raymond, you say that all, I think you say all showrunners in the world are the same. Not showrunners, all executives. Yeah. The, All TV executives are the same. I think so. I think there's a certain mentality mm -hmm. of being the boss in that in that situation. You know, we're, we're here's the thing: the people in charge of show business are more involved with business than show. Yeah, right. But they get to say what your show will be or not, right? 
a lot of the times they're dictating to you what yeah, the if, show if needs they... to be to make it on the air. Mm -hmm. Now, a mistake is you take all those notes. Then right. you've ruined your show. So there's a there's a battle, a constant struggle right. between honoring what they say they want and need and honoring your own uh, vision. Your truth to the yeah. project. Now, here's yeah. a great example of that. Yeah. You're, you're talking to the woman who's playing the wife of Raymond, the Russian actress, and yeah. she wants to wear this amazingly elaborate, beautiful... That was the costume lady. The costume the, who lady. Who wanted to dress her that way. That's she who wants, I'm talking to. Okay, yeah. she yeah. wants to wear this outfit as if yeah. you're going out to high tea with the exactly. queen. Exactly. And you say to her... I say, this, you know, she's cleaning the house in this scene. And she says, yes, but she's on television. And I said to her, yes, but she doesn't know she's on television. She thinks she's just cleaning the house. <laughs> and the costume lady thinks it will be very boring. Here's the thing. I'm trying to impart to them that the show is about real life. It doesn't have to be our real life in America. I want it to be true to your life. And they say, real life is terrible. <laughs> Why would we show that on television? But so I that see was their the point. struggle. But I see their yes. point. Yes. And so how did yeah, that, people are, how did that people resolve America itself? Are happy. Well, yeah. I don't want to tell you the end of the movie. But how does but that resolve itself? Sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Sometimes it doesn't. Therein lies the comedy of the human uh, situation. Well, and yeah. this Netflix, it's streaming right now. You can you watch can it. You can see it now. Right and now, by the Netflix. way, uh, I'll have what Phil's having. All six episodes that we shot for PBS are also on Netflix. Now. And I want to talk about that in one second. But here's yeah. something else about <laughs> exporting Raymond. There's a yeah. shot in there of you watching your parents yeah. try to show you their slideshow from Russia. Amazing. They went to Russia on vacation. <laughs> yes. They come back. They've got this really nice. It's one of the first like scenes a, of the movie. I, first, I, I right, went there they've got to, this awesome macintosh computer yeah. this beautiful monitor yeah. somebody's obviously set them up in their mm -hmm. their, their no, office that's theirs. Area. it's there yeah it's there yeah. yeah. but i mean somebody came in and said hey this is going to be a great computer for you guys right this will be easy for you to use probably Here's one of their do. children yes right. <laughs> so then they say hey let me guess which one <laughs> yeah. philip philip we're we know you're going over to russia right. you're going to be doing this look documentary at our, look at so our photos come in and show us your yeah. photos that's one of the funniest three minutes of television i've ever seen in my life well thanks thanks uh all i wanted to do was i knew they had been to russia i thought this might be good to talk to them before I go. We'll film that. And the audience will see the genesis of where the parents on Raymond came from. Right. And get the little Russia backstory before I go. Because what's happening is the, the, the playback of the slideshow is mm -hmm. going so quickly. They only yeah. have like three to four seconds between And they between don't know slides. how it works. And they don't know how it works. They're like so the, the Wizard and the Wizard of Oz. Or they're, they're watching right. a, I the slideshow. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how it works. And the music is playing, you know, the canned music. It's not their music. Yeah, it's just yeah. that what iPhoto is putting out. That's right. And it's playing so loudly. And his mom is <laughs> desperately trying to keep up. Oh, that was a government <laughs> building. No, no, it was a church on top of the... It's St. Petersburg. No, yeah. no, it was Moscow. And my father says, well, that building that was destroyed by the Nazis. And my mother says, the Nazis never got to Moscow. Yes, they did. No, they did not. <laughs> and the slides are going through. This remind me. I went to my mom was from Germany and we and we were riding in a in a large bus and uh, they were giving the tour in three languages. They were doing German, yeah, and like uh, Spanish, and then English. Right. The, the same person. The same person. By wow. the time she said the third version in English, we were five blocks course, away fantastic. from whatever the hell she was talking about. Fantastic. It's fantastic. But I just they wanted, have your money already. I just remember something I want to compliment you specifically about Raymond on, which is having the best ending to a show. Oh. The ending that I always wanted, Thank because you. to me, it's always weird when a show ends and like. You know, somebody moves out of town or somebody, you know, we're, we all got fired from uh, WGN with and it's like I'm like, I don't want to in my mind, everybody on the show is still living their lives together. And at the end, they always have like this couple breaks up. People move to other parts of the country, yeah. isn't it sad? And yours was it just ends on everybody arguing in the living room and it fades out and they're still there today. That's where they're at. And that's ex I and I was like, finally, I remember watching it thinking. Finally, somebody did it right. Thanks. So I wanted to say that was... I, I can t honestly yeah. tell you that is exactly why we did it that way. Wow. I, I, I'm so pleased. Life, real life is hard enough. It's why I don't play golf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me talk to you about your new show on PBS, I'll Have What Phil's Having. You're going around the world. You do these six episodes, Hong Kong, Japan. You're yeah. everywhere. Yeah. When you go to Hong Kong or a place like that... Yeah. Do you have to eat the local cuisine? I mean, I understand the point of the show is the culture, the local cuisine, but yeah. do they have Italian food in Hong Kong? They do. They have everything. It's a, Hong Kong is one of the crossroads of the world. 
They have more food. They have, it's, it's a food culture over there. It's fantastic. So do they have, would you ever on the show go yeah. to a restaurant that yeah. is not the, yeah. that culture? As a matter of fact, Tell I me. go to, in Hong Kong, in that episode, I go to a place from a, an Israeli guy who was raised in Canada and is doing Japanese yakitori in Hong Kong. No, I This oh, is so wow. Hong Kong. If Hong Kong is a mashup, <laughs> this kid is a mashup. Yeah. You know I what love I mean? that. And his, and his partner's a mashup of, of Scottish, Japanese, Chinese living in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has everything. You're, you're, it's a thrill to be there. Yeah. And it's completely accessible to Americans because everything's in English. Yeah. 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 Every, every sign. Is in yeah. Chinese and then English. Every announcement on the subway is Chinese and then English, and so there's zero barrier. Yeah, you're yeah, just exactly. it's like you're you're obviously it's like a big Chinatown, but it's also everything else in the world. It's is very there. accessible. No, yeah. I know that's one of the great yeah the, one of the great things I I love about you know go, it's like I I've, my mother's from Germany, so I've been to Germany, and yes. it's like you go there and there's like a huge Turkish population right. in Germany. Turkish people are like the Mexicans of Germany. They they immigrate there and do the jobs. Really, that 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 you know the Germans don't want to do, and they uh-huh. run all the food. Really, right? So it's like there's all this like an influx of Turkish food to have a donar, which is their version of a euro. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like it's fantastic. Wow! And you're like sitting there, and for some reason, curry somehow became a big thing. This is thing. in uh, Berlin. This is in Berlin, but really all over uh-huh. Frankfurt. I haven't been in Berlin yet, but you Berlin know. is amazing. Berlin is like New York, it's so cosmopolitan, a thousand right? times over. Yeah, I almost did stand up comedy in Berlin. A guy t- I did was doing stand up in London. Yeah. The guy said, "I'm going to see my mom." He's like, "Oh, I know a guy in in Berlin." Yeah, and I go to the show. I can't find the guy, and it's like there's a juggler. Yeah, there's an acrobat. There's a mime, and then there would be a guy come out and do. Comedy in English, yeah. which people would listen to and then applaud at the end. They couldn't laugh because then you would oh. have to concentrate on listening to the English. Hilarious. Was, was this like, the Comedy Bunker? The Comedy Berlin? Bunker? No, it was across from the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, uh, I forgot what the old joke was. But it was like, yeah, it was like on the seventh story of an abandoned building yeah. in something that looks like Soho. Right. And you're right, you're driving, you're, you're like, this is the craziest place I've ever been in my life. So where oh, do you want to go? Where else do you yeah, want to go, your, Phil? What's your next well, one? But, uh, my motivation to do the show, it's not just so you could watch me eat. It's, <laughs> it's really to get, motivate you to get off the couch to come and travel because two-thirds of us don't have a passport even mm. in America. I didn't realize that. It's true. And, and, uh, and that's including the people who came to America with a passport. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's true. Yeah, Americans don't. And I just think the world would be a little bit better if we all could experience a little bit of somebody else's experience, right? So, so, so I started, the first six were Hong Kong, Tokyo, Paris, Barcelona, Florence, and to me the best food city in America at the moment, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So I'm starting with what I think are Earth's greatest hits. <laughs> now, if I do more, I'm going to continue. I haven't yeah. scratched the surface of yeah. the Earth. Of course. For the her greatest hits. Of I course. have there's many more. So the cities that come to the top of your mind, like New York and yeah. London, those are next. Yes. Right? Good. Good. Okay. I'm excited. Um what about England? Why can't they pull it together? In London. Terms of, uh, you haven't cuisine. been to London in a while, have you? I haven't. Christine's what is not the a cu- fan of London. No, but, but it's a world cuisine? it's What's a going world on? it's now a world class food city. Is that if you have money? Only if you have money not, or not at all. Not really? At, um, listen, I am not interested in doing the elite guide to the world. Right. I'm interested in all food that is delicious. Yes. I don't care if it costs a dollar on the street. Okay. Good is good. Yeah. There's exactly. only two kinds of anything. I'd rather have a fantastic hot dog than a f- bad four hour French extravaganza, right? I agree. In, I agree. In a fa- with fancy tablecloths. I don't care. I agree. And so if something is really special, I think when we go on vacation, we, we look for the one night maybe that we're going to splurge. Yeah. This place is world famous. We got to go there if we're going to Tokyo. And so, then yeah. let the chef like feed you as it were. I love that. I love that too, right? But I love that even in a cheap restaurant. Mm-hmm. What are you famous for? Like, Give it to me. Uh, what I, what do they call that? Price fix or something? Yeah, price fix is a set menu, mm-hmm. meaning, yeah. meaning the, your, your price is going to be this. It's fixed. Yeah. And yeah. so the chef that was has fine when I travel. I always love to go. I, I hate to go where the tourists eat. I always want to go where the locals eat. Yeah. I'll just wander into a neighborhood that is like not, yeah. it's like it's not in my book, so yeah. I'll go in there. That's great. I remember I was in London years yeah. ago, and I was like, 
I want to have breakfast. And I see these guys in overalls. They're like construction guys walking in this little diner. I'm like, that's where I'm going. So, I'm going to where the locals go and also where the chefs who know something about oh, food yeah. are yeah. going. Yeah. So you're getting an, a real expert's guide as they're teaching, telling me what to have. I'm yeah. telling you what to have. May yeah, I exactly. recommend you go to Istanbul? Yeah, that that's has on the list. some incredible food. You know, it's very popular there is yeah. sheep's brain, which I did oh, not yeah. try, but it looks just like a sheep's brain sitting on a plate. You know what I mean? Like it's just the brain and it's there. So, you know, and- I'm not really going to try that yeah. <laughs> unless. Well, it's there's an alcohol they drink truly with it. forced on me. Yeah. I mean, in Istanbul, I, there's this Turkish alcohol that's kind of like an anise uh, yeah. that they drink with it. So if you, when you eat the sheep's uh, brain, yeah. you get a shot of this licorice. You're telling like, me two this, alcohol. You're, at the same you're not time. making it sound better. I'm just I saying. Yeah, I'm yeah, just saying. Hate, that's what they do. I hate licorice yeah. flavored uh, liqueur. It's the worst right. thing ever. So it's two terrible things. What about too that terrible. eel skull you ate? Yeah, I didn't mean to. Tell us about that. <laughs> that was that was you know I went to this really cool place and I was loving it. Eel is very good. Eel. Unagi eel. is my yes. favorite sushi. You got it's it. cooked. It just tastes it's like grilled. grilled fish. It right? is grilled, yeah. yeah. With a little honey on it. Something whatever, sweet. Whatever it is, it's fantastic. Mm. So I went to this place, this little place that there's an old guy, and he's got little ske- wooden skewers over a little hibachi yeah. about one foot wide. That's the whole restaurant. Seven chairs around the <laughs> counter, and this old guy in this decrepit place in the middle yeah. of an alley, and I'm told by an expert, yeah. this is the shit. This is, you want to be here. <laughs> so- your dinner is going to be seven skewers of eel. Now, what I didn't realize was they were going to be seven parts of the eel. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. What? I thought there was only one part that you ate. So did I until <laughs> I started eating it. And I get to this one piece, and, oh, this bun, there's a little bone in here. I'll just take that out. Oh, the, the, oh there's a little more bone. Oh, this is impossible. Was now, it cartilage? It's the skull of the eel. (laughs) And all it is is burnt skin over bone. (laughs) And I'm like, well, I have to turn to my friend who's taken me there and say, what is the appeal? Yeah. Right? Because I'm somewhat open-minded, but this one I'm just not getting. He says, well, it's kind of a test. I said, what what do you mean a test? Test of manliness. (laughs) Uh, What? To eat it? Yeah, you chew the bones. Now, I'm telling you, this is not like little... Light bones. This is like, like salmon bones. This, this is, is like is... eat eat this bottle cap. I'm just so <laughs> okay? not interested. Like yeah. that. And I'm like, I don't. Uh, this is. A, you can call me Mary because I'm not a man because I'm not eating these bones. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Now listen, some I, things I'm not doing. <laughs> I uh, was in the Peace Corps in in the South Pacific, right? Yeah. And one of the things the children would do on the island I lived on to yeah. freak out the Palangi or the white person is yeah. they would catch fish right out of the ocean or they would right. stab it with a stick yeah. and they'd take the fish right out of the ocean they go, Arr! and they just eat the fish right out of the ocean. So you're, they're in the ocean. Yeah. They pull the fish out of the water and, and bite, they it. bite into it and just to see your reaction and they'd suck the eyes out of the fish. Oh. I know. Pow, suck it out. What about that? Yeah, what about that? <laughs> I would probably have the reaction I just had. No. Yeah. Oh, the I'm other not thing they uh, did doing that either. was they yeah. loved pig. That was like a, you know, a really a, yeah. uh, exotic delicacy, food, a yes. delicacy. And they would eat the pig snout and okay. the pig eyes and the eyelids, like all those little pig parts, those little ears, those things. Yeah. Very, very special, apparently. Yeah. So someone like Anthony Bourdain is a superhero. He was a chef and he knows the food world. He's an expert. And you, he's, a, he's afraid. Do you think he's afraid? He, he never lets on that he's scared. But I think he might be scared. I'm scared of what? The food? I don't think he's scared at all. I think think he loves eating that shit. Here's what I say. I'm exactly like Anthony Bourdain (laughs) if he was afraid of everything. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Right? (laughs) Yes. That's me. I'm I'm not doing, I'm not going to Beirut to get shot at. I'm not going to, the the other day he had a a, a show where he went to Borneo and he got drunk with the tribesmen. And now that they were sufficiently drunk, they said, how about a tattoo? And so (laughs) now he lies down, he opens his shirt and his chest is there. And here's how you do a tattoo in Borneo. They tap nails into the, your chest for two hours with ink on it oh. until you have the, the thing. They're drunk. You have to be drunk. And the, you see blood on his chest. And you see that? I'm like, you got to be kidding. I wouldn't let you do one nail. Yeah. Not one. He's there for two hours. Anthony He's Bourdain. Yeah. superhero. He's an animal. Yes, so I'm the opposite. I am the guy who's watching Bourdain He's saying, Superman he's amazing, Clark Kent. I'm never doing But that. also, yes. you're not trying to do something so exotic. You're just trying to introduce people, yes. bring together people yes. and humor. There is another side. You don't way. have to, to travel. You don't have to do that. Yeah. You can go and have a nice time. You can stay yeah. in a hotel with I think, sheets. I think your point from earlier is, is well taken. There's too many Americans who just would consider anything outside their comfort zone to be weird, 
and exotic and undoable. There are people in this country who have never left the United States. Have never they left their town. Yeah, they haven't left their state. I know so yes. many people here in California yes. who have never left the state of California. All right. It's like, wh- why? But, but, Drive but to Vegas. But, but Do worse. something. The point of the L.A. episode, in addition to telling you that yeah. it's the best food city in America, is that we have neighborhoods the way every other town has neighborhoods that people are afraid to go in. Yeah. Because they are they don't know. But now we have this device. Yeah. You got your phone. In our pockets. You got your phone in the pocket. tell us yeah. what there is in every neighborhood. You don't have yeah. to go to a it's Lonely Planet easy. guide. No. You can just say, best eel in Los Feliz, I and heard tell about. You. I heard about Ethiopian food. Yeah. This young lady didn't like it, but maybe I'm interested I enjoyed, and I try it. I enjoyed the, you know, the evening. I enjoyed the restaurant, the setting. The, uh, well, the, I'll tell you, I had a bad experience on that street okay. once, eight years ago, and I never went back. This is It's funny that you say this. Until two weeks ago, and somebody said, you got to go to Meals by Gannett, G-E-N-E-T. Okay. Okay. I said, it, that's Ethiopian food. Meals yes, by Gannett. But it's great. On I Fairfax. said, okay. I go, same looking stuff. No silverware. Tasted with your hands. completely different. That where the first place tasted blah and bland and not interested, boring. Mm-hmm. This had many varieties of spice and spiciness, and the bread was better, and it okay. was hot, and it was delicious. And I loved every second of it, and I can't wait to go back. Okay, good How to about hear. That? Good to hear. So that I. You just have to give it a shot. Yeah. What, look, we're not children. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> well, I don't like it. You know what? Right? So- I don't like it, so you don't need <laughs> it anymore. Well, all we do with our kids is try it, try it, try it. So now, right. you know, take your own advice, yeah. parents. <laughs> yeah. Try it. Well, also, all of these experiences uh, is what adds up to a really good quality life. Because at the end of the day, you know, here I'm looking at you, and you've had so much success, not only in the sitcoms, but in documentaries and movies. And, you know, now you've got this new show, and you're, you're, you're constantly in motion. You're constantly moving forward. But you say that really the only important thing is loving your family, laughing, crying, flying a kite with your kid, eat some new food. <laughs> the show embodies everything I love in life. This particular that. show right now. If I could do this show for the rest of my life, it would be a very happy life. Well, so what no is reason it? you can't. I you do six down episodes my... a year, you're all set. I, well, I want to do more than that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I've boiled down my years on earth to these important things. Food, family, friends, laughs, travel. I can think of these one more the... F word. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that, that, that's the... If family you think part. about it, family, family comes from that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so there's... Those are, for me, the fun things in life, the great things in life, and so they're my favorites. I would always rather spend money, at a, even if coffee's overpriced. I'd rather be in a coffee shop with a friend because right. I'm having an experience. Of I'm having course. an exchange. I don't care if it costs fucking six bucks a cup, cup of coffee. That's not the point. The point is this time that I'm spending with you because this place exists it's the for excuse. us to have a, a meeting. Well, now you're getting at what the real point of the show is. The food, and hopefully the humor, if you think it's funny, is just the way in. Yeah. It's really not about the food. It's mm-hmm. about connecting with the people. And we all got to eat. Well, that's how we've been since we were cave people, right? We eat together. That's just how it is. Yeah. It's in our DNA to eat with. Yes. And so I think we bond over that uh, human experience, and then we're cemented, I think, as friends by a... An appreciation of each other's sense of humor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, some people are humorless. They're meant for each other. <laughs> but I like the way you laugh. I like the way you tell a story. I, I, it's not the way I would, but I appreciate yours. Yeah. So I think even beyond friends, I think it's who we marry. Wow. Yeah, I really that's do. That's exactly right. I don't have to tell you that everything else falls away after a while. <laughs> And all you're yeah. left with are the laughs, hopefully. And believe me, when they go, I think you go. Yeah. Yeah, I know. When yeah, when you see these really old couples and they're just so in pain and they can't laugh anymore, it's like they're just like, I'm done. I think. I'm done. I think yeah. they're waiting to die. Don't wait to die. Have a good time. We're only here for a little while. I, I know. We just recently that. lost some famous people. It's like they're yes. they're once you get past like fifty. Anybody could go at any time. There are people who die at 69, and there are people who are still going strong at 93. You got it. It's complete. We have, you have no idea in that last half, that last uh, well, third of your life. Well, I have a philosophy. Uh, Let's hear your it's philosophy. It's my, my biggest philosophy of life. Well, after 40, don't fall down. 
<laughs> hey, good... Here's another philosophy you have, and I love this. You say, <laughs> do the show you want to do, because in the end, they're going to cancel you anyways. Yes. Ed Weinberger told me that. Great showrunner. Oh, God. Ed I Weinberger. guess I know his name was on everything he was on in the 70s. a lot of stuff. But that's, listen to that. Yeah. Do the show you want to do, because in the end, they're going to cancel you anyway. That's the best advice I ever got about anything. It's not just about your show or show business. It is about life, isn't it? Yeah. We all get canceled one day. Right, right. So time, are you time doing the wins. show you want to do? Yeah. yeah. Are you living the life you want to live? How about your parents said to you, as I understand it, they said, Raymond, you are, Raymond, they <laughs> say, Philip, you're watching so much TV. Yes. What are you going to do? Get a job watching television? Yes. They did tell me that for years. And the moment that I got a job, I sent them as a gift the biggest TV I could find at the time with a note on it that said, ha ha. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. But it's interesting though, because watching TV isn't really living life. So you're, you're... 100% right. Okay, so, but I guess because where you're growing up in Queens, New York, that was your way out? I was out? in Queens, I was in Bronx, I was in, I was in uh, Rockland County, and I was a little kid, I was a little skinny nothing. And to me, even though I wanted to be living a real life, the TV was better. Mm. The TV was my friend when I didn't have a lot of friends. If I was oh, picked, that was me. That's how I was and I was the guy. I mean, I watched everything, but I watched The Tonight Show. Me too. When I was like 10, 11, yeah. 12 years me old. Too. I remember being in like sixth grade and they said, yes, sir. I said, okay, well, everybody named their favorite show. And right. it's like, you know, The Partridge Family. Right. And I go The Tonight Show with Johnny Great. Carson. And she looks Great. at me like, why the hell are you up late enough? Because... Yes. Because my snuck. parents are paying no attention to me. Honest, right. tell Phil what happened when your family was on vacation and you left in 1972, oh, was it? Okay, no, this is 1973. I'm 73, 74. We're on, we're on vacation and we go camping, which is a fucking nightmare. It could be a whole horror <laughs> genre into itself. Yeah. But uh, we actually are staying at a motel, yeah. which okay. we never did. Okay. And my family decides to go out to dinner, which they never did. And you think I'd be like, finally. But I'm like, no. I have to stay back in the hotel room. I'm 12 years old. I have to stay in the hotel room to watch Richard Nixon's resignation speech. <laughs> wow. By myself. Yeah. I sat and watched that. And it's like. I would have been the same. I don't want to miss that. Yeah. No, yeah. I was like, this is awesome. This is the end of the greatest show that's ever been on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I couldn't. Yeah. I was like, nope, I'm not going to dinner with you people. I got to see what Dick Did does. Did they miss the moon landing too, your parents? <laughs> They're pretty. Yeah, they were. They were I busy mean, fighting somewhere. Hey, listen, yes. man, you want to play some shotgun story worthy? No. <laughs> the word gun is in it. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! Accidents. Okay. So we did an Italy episode of our show, and... Uh... I took my parents to Italy before we shot. I had some time for pre-production, mm -hmm. and I took them. And we went to Venice, and we stayed in a nice, beautiful hotel in Venice, and we were getting ready for dinner. They were in my, their room. I was in my room. And, and uh, there's a knock at the door, and it's my father standing in the hallway of a very nice hotel in his underpants. <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, we're not at home. Yeah. And he said, Mom fell. And I run over there, and there's my mom. She's sitting on the bed and holding her face with a towel, and there's blood. She fell getting out of the shower and broke her cheek. Oh, mm. God. Right? And so they come up. The Venetians come up with a beautiful, what looks like a wheelchair without wheels. It's beautiful wicker, and the arms of the chair where you'd rest your arms extend out for them to carry you. Oh. And arms on the back as well. And they carry her down the steps and onto an ambulance boat. <laughs> right my wife goes with her and she said you go to dinner i'll be there in a f when i can she was one hour later she came with an ice bag on her face so i make fun of my mom for a living right that's what i do <laughs> but she was an absolute trooper and i'm glad i get to tell this story yeah because she was much braver and better than yeah. i would ever be if i broke a fingernail <laughs> yeah right this is this is my mother She's fantastic, and I wanted to tell that story. Wow, that's a great fantastic. story. Yeah. And you know what? It's weird when you get hurt in a foreign country. Yes. You never know exactly 
You yeah. don't know the procedures. You don't know how to communicate the information. Right. It's tough. So what happens when you break your cheek? Like your cheekbone, right? It kind of never heals right. There's always a, like a little bump there now. That's so upsetting. So you put. But ice she on had it, eleven can... stitches on top of the cheek. Oh God, bless her, and man! She How just, scary she was that? And she just she was not going to miss. She was not going to ruin our time. That is so amazing. And that happened the, the first night of the trip. Wow. And she was with us the rest of the trip and was fantastic. And so would and she amazing. come your along? Mu- your wife went instead of you. She wanted your wife to go with her. My wife is, I think. I'm not going to generalize, but women are better at these things. Yeah. I think men uh, are, are just, all we do is wring our hands and we don't know what the hell No, yeah, we, yeah, men like to solve a problem I and there's so. no solving. It's this just, is just hold a hand at a thing. So and by the way, your she, wife is uh, yeah. Monica Horan, who played Amy, very interesting, Robert's wife on television. Very interesting quick story about how yes. she got that part. She slept with the producer. Wow. <laughs> who, who hears about these? I, I recommend these that, stories. by the way, to... Uh, to, to People who want to get in show business. Listen, when you were in Italy, so now your parents are over there with you. Did they come on set with you? Or were they involved in that respect? Or did they go off on their own and tour? They were with me for the pre-production part. And then when it came time to shoot, I needed them all to get the hell out of here. So Listen, they, they must yeah. be so proud of you. They're somewhat proud of me. Yes, they are. It doesn't mean they don't bother me anymore. No, yeah. they're proud of you, but they don't communicate it, which is a sep- which is a parent thing. You know what I mean? That's like you don't realize how proud your parents are. Like I just found uh, my cousin's daughter found a bunch of home movies and put them on DVD, and I'm watching these yesterday. Yeah. And it's like you realize how much your parents were paying attention to you, except that it didn't feel like it at the time. That's Because they true. weren't saying anything, true. but they're photographing you, true. and they're, you know, and now you're playing with all these other people, and you're with your cousins, yes. and you're like, oh, I remember this as being a horribly lonely experience, and yes. it doesn't look like it. You don't realize how much they are. In fact, like Christine's daughter is eight. She has no idea how much you think about her. I ask Alabama all the time. I say, honey, how's your childhood going? Yeah. She goes, mom. I say, really, Alabama, what am I doing? Am I messing up? What am I doing, man? How, yeah. how are we doing here? Nice. But she seems uh, she seems okay. That's great. Yeah. My parents, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 56 in a couple of weeks. And my dad's going to be 90 wow, in two great. months, and, and my mom's 82. And they're proud of me, but it's like I'm five. They worry about me. Yeah. yeah. And they worry, like, the show, did you hear? It's the show, you're doing more episodes. Did you hear anything? I said, not yet. Uh, I'm sure it'll be okay. <laughs> but what are we going to do if it doesn't? Oh I think gosh. I'll be okay, Mom. Yeah, let me see. Can I live on the residuals of one of the most successful sitcoms ever? Yes, I think so I'll be all sweet. right. <laughs> that is so sweet. So they still feel your anxiety, or they take on your anxiety. They worry about me. It never goes away. I worry about my boy's 21. I worry about him. You just my have daughter's one son? 18. Oh, two, two kids. My daughter's 18. I worry about her. It's our jobs. Don't you worry about your daughter? All the time. It's never going to go away. No, it I don't want it to. It might get a little less, Yeah. you know? But hopefully, if you've done it right, they start worrying about you. Yes. Yeah, the idea is you to, to yes. literally push them out Please take so care that they can turn now. around. Yeah, I've heard that, and that, yes. that, that my daughter's going to be, or she kind of is a tweenie now, nine years old, yes. eight years old. And so I, I understand that they kind of have to turn into little assholes so that you can say, get the fuck out and be That's on your nature's own way. to yeah. get out That's, and then yes. start on their own. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for coming on our I show. I on. Yes, really appreciate you. it. It thank means you. a lot to me. By the way, tell the folks how we met, you and I. We got to go to a rehearsal of a, of a television special that featured Bruce Springsteen, and, and I'm a huge fan. In fact, my birthday's coming up, and he's playing Madison Square Garden in New York, and I'm going oh, on my birthday. come on. To oh, see man. the play The River Tour, which has so significance for, for me because the first – time i saw him was the original river tour in 1980 that's so awesome, this is a big man. deal for me that's a big that's big fantastic. deal have a wonderful time i will yeah it was really exciting to see him that minute and uh, we have a mutual friend david wild he's yes, done our show as love well david and he is a stellar human being as well yes. yeah we're lucky to be in this town and meet cool people i'm lucky to meet you oh you're so sweet and you oh thank you <laughs> yeah right, and, you see, and we're just people you people out there in the wheat fields, we're just people. <laughs> All right, you guys, we're going to wrap it up right about now. I want to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Sean Merrick, Roddy Swearingen, Maria Spertolozzi, and, of course, Ben Stewart. Ben, thanks for recording ben with Stewart, us today. Ben Stewart, the only one ben. actually in the room. Everyone else is doing cocaine somewhere. Oh, yeah, that's what they do over at Sideshow oh, Network. Oh, yeah, exactly. big on the cocaine. And, of course, I want to thank John Thomas Griffith. You know, he wrote the theme song, Follow Me. I have no idea who that is. He's a great guy. Love that guy. And, of course, I want to thank you, Phil Rosenthal. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate right. it so thank much. Thank you. And, of course, on behalf of you, Hannah Spinney, my dear friend and co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy of you. Thank you.
Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Caregivers, are you and the person you care for not satisfied with your current home care agency? Then you need to call Help at Home as we offer the highest paid wages, weekly pay, overtime pay, benefits, and do not forget paid time off. Help at Home is actively recruiting caregivers who are caring for a loved one. We make changing agencies quick and easy. Call one of our care professionals now at 412-784-6711. That's 412-784-6711 or go to helpathomepa.com. This week on RVER, sponsored by Progressive Insurance. I'm sorry, I can't operate on that vehicle. But doctor, you took an oath. That RV, it's my son's RV. Oh, doctor, isn't there anything you can do? I'm not a miracle worker, Sheila. I'm an RV surgeon, trained to save the lives of large injured recreational vehicles, which is definitely a real profession. When your RV really needs saving, Progressive has you covered. See if you could save with a leader in RV insurance. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates covered subject to policy terms. Make their Christmas unforgettable with goat guns. Looking for the perfect gift for your husband or man who is a gun lover? Look no further. Goat guns are the greatest gift of all time miniature gun models. They are the perfect blend of quality and detail. From pistols to rifles, there's a goat gun for every collector, history buff, or gamer. Whether for display or for a fun collecting hobby, goat guns will bring joy and excitement to him. Surprise your loved ones this Christmas with a goat gun, the ultimate gift that won't disappoint. Shop at GoatGuns.com.